Floyd's in the magazine. Actually, thus far, I've been making some comments about the uh, first article on cosmology or the Big Bang. So essentially, there are four main themes to this article. Namely, uh, first of all, that the scientific theories are highly speculative. Secondly, that there are definite defects in these theories that can be pointed out. Uh, and then the third one is that the uh, Big Bang model, as <coughs> is true of all scientific models of origin, uh, cannot explain how variegated uh, complex reality emerges from something that is not variegated and complex. That is, how can something come out of nothing? And then the fourth main point here is that the uh, picture of reality presented in the uh, Vedic scriptures is essentially what we call higher dimensional, to use a term borrowed from science. Uh, but the scientists themselves are proposing various things that are uh, higher dimensional. So the Vedic literature proposes what is wrong with that. So those are four uh, basic points that are made in this article. And of course, two of those are uh, negative in character, namely that uh, the theories of the scientists are speculative and that they have various defects. So uh, that merely, uh, those points are really made to tear down what they're saying. But the other uh, two points also can be used to build up the uh, Vedic worldview that we would like to present. So I've uh, thus far made some points concerning this idea that uh, reality is actually higher dimensional. So uh, I think I should make a few more points about that because this is uh, quite important. So the last time uh, I gave a historical uh, summary uh, in which the basic point was that originally people believed in a universe in which there was room for a personal God outside of the shells of the universe, there's what in Europe is called the Empyrean realm, uh, which we would call by Kunta. Uh, and this is where God as a person can uh, have his uh, kingdom. So this made it very uh, easy to believe in God. After all, what are you going to put outside of the shells of the universe anyway? Simply avoid. You have to have something there. So. What happens, though, with the development of modern uh, cosmology and astronomy is that the idea of the universe with a, uh, a covering and then a region outside in which God could exist was replaced with the idea that reality is three-dimensional Euclidean space that extends to infinity and is just full of matter. And the matter, for that matter, is very thinly distributed. Uh, hmm. It's uh, mostly just empty space. Hmm. So, so, by the way, we have this cartoon here. Uh, you know, seen. This is a thing that we can try. Actually, this is a picture of this was originally from Martin Luther's Bible. You know that. And uh, it was a picture of Jehovah presiding over the creation. So in this circle here, originally there was a picture of the earth with Adam and Eve standing in the Garden of Eden. And significantly enough, it shows the universe contained within a shell. So Martin Luther was thinking that way an interesting point. But what we did was uh, put the Big Bang here in place of uh, the Garden of Eden. And then uh, in the original picture, Jehovah was uh, holding his hands up in some kind of 
Western mudras indicating his uh, benediction. But uh, we put here a, a clipboard with an equation in one hand and a calculator in the other hand to indicate the uh, modern conception of uh, the creation, namely that everything is running according to some equation. So, uh, actually the point behind that is that according to the uh, modern scientific theory, the whole world is running according to the solutions to some mathematical equation. And if God exists at all, his only role is to sustain matter so that it can interact according to those equations. In fact, we were just looking at this BBC uh, broadcast in which uh, a physicist from Cambridge uh, followed a semi-Vedic uh, practice by becoming a Roman Catholic priest when he became old. So it's almost like taking some yacht. So uh, this was considered to be quite unusual. But he was exp uh, expounding his philosophy, which is that God is simply sustaining the universe, uh, holding everything up, as it were, and that everything is happening within the universe in accordance with the, uh, the laws of physics, which are set up by God. However, if that's true, it eliminates religion completely because it means that we are simply arrangements of atomic particles, or whatever they may be, moving according to the laws of physics. And it may be that God is holding the whole thing up so it can all happen, but still we're just moving according to the laws of physics. So if we pray to God, that's just another thing that's happening according to the laws of physics. It has nothing to do with God. And there's no question of God responding to our prayer, because if he did that, he'd be interfering with those laws. But that's not what he's doing. He's just maintaining the law. So, uh, in one stroke, this philosophy totally kicks out religion. You may have God, but you don't have religion. And you don't have the idea that the individual human being has anything to do with God. The human being is just a collection of atoms. So, this is the philosophy of deism. So actually, the Vedic philosophy uh, is a quite different viewpoint. There are laws governing how matter operates, and Krishna is enforcing those laws, but they are more like the laws of a uh, state or a nation in which there are options for doing different things. They're not like the laws of physics in which everything just flows from cause to effect inexorably. So, uh, and also Krishna can either enforce his particular laws, which basically these are known as the laws of karma, uh, or if he wants, he can uh, not enforce them. In fact, that's Krishna's role. Uh, he was saying that again, Mukunda means that uh, Krishna can give liberation. So that means that he can suspend his laws for a given spirit soul. And only he can do it. The demigods aren't granted this power because they're within uh, or under the jurisdiction of the law of karma themselves. But uh, Krishna can either enforce the laws or uh, not enforce them as he wishes. So it's a different conception. So I wanted to say something about this idea of faith. Uh, you were saying the other day that... Uh, the idea developed that the universe consists of three-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, then Einstein came along and suggested that it consists of four-dimensional non-Euclidean space. So he introduced the idea that space itself curves in such a way that it can curve around on itself. And this is a little bit hard to imagine. Uh, the Vedic conception, though, presents an even more amazing idea about space. So, uh, to get an idea of that, you could consider the, the statement made in the Brahma Samhita, actually it's the, the 35th verse, where it says that, uh, that Govinda 
is an undifferentiated entity and there's no distinction between him and his potency. And it goes on to say that all of the universes are contained within the form of Govinda, but at the same time, Govinda is present in his fullness within every atom uh, within the universe. So, one can consider the, the implications of that. Uh, what is being said there is that within the personal form of Krishna, and of course this is very much describing a personal form here, uh, you have all the universes. So, there's Krishna and there's all the universes there within him. So then you go into one of these universes and then within that universe you pick out an atom, any atom you like. And you go down within that atom, so you have to tremendously reduce your scale of size to get down to an atom. And then within that atom, there's Krishna. And it explicitly says that in his fullness he is present there. It's not that just part of him is present, or some aspect of Krishna, or some manifestation of him, or something like that. But in his fullness he's present there, which means he's all there. But that means that within him there are all the universes again. And you can go down to within one of those universes, anyone you like, and pick an atom, and then within that atom there's Krishna. So, essentially what this is saying is that every point is connected to every other point through Krishna, if you think about that. Uh, because suppose you could pass through Krishna. Now, this isn't even a speculative uh, idea because I'll give you a Shastra reference for it in a moment. But suppose you could pass through Krishna. Then you could travel to any universe instantaneously. How could you do that? Well, take an atom like this one right here and just shrink down, assuming you can shrink yourself, this power is required, and pass through Krishna and go to any one of the universes, since they're all within Krishna. And there you are. You've traveled to another universe. Just like that. So actually, uh, if you look in the Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll find many uh, references which show that, that this kind of process actually works. For example, there are two occasions in which Mother Yasoda looks into Krishna's mouth and sees the entire universe. Uh, in fact, uh, it's described there that, uh, for example, when Krishna was accused of eating dirt by his uh, cowherd boyfriend, he said, no, I'm not eating dirt. Just look in my mouth and see if there's any dirt there or not. So Mother Yasoda looked into Krishna's mouth and instead of seeing dirt, she saw all the universes. And, in fact, she saw Mother Yasoda looking into Krishna's mouth. So, uh, of course you may say, well, this is just a vision. Krishna projected a vision so that Mother Yasoda experienced this. But then, uh, there's also the description uh, of the experience of Markandeya Rishi, for example. It seems that Markandeya Rishi had asked uh, Nara Narayan for the benediction of being able to see the, the material energy. Uh, this is a somewhat dangerous benediction to ask for. So Krishna showed him. So uh, what happened was that Mahandeya Rishi was uh, given a direct uh, experience of being able to live through the devastation at the end of the day of Brahma. So uh, without dying. So, Markandeya Rishi was uh, awash in the midst of the ocean of devastation. And he was simply being hurtled back and forth by tremendous waves and so forth, and there was no land anywhere. And this was a little bit disconcerting. So, at a certain point, he saw this island, which was very effulgent, and which was situated in the midst of this vast ocean. and on the leaf of a banyan tree in that island, there was this little uh, baby resting on a leaf. Uh, 
which was quite remarkable. And this child was extremely attractive. As a matter of fact, it was Krishna. He was uh, laying there. And so, uh, Martin Deya Rishi, of course, he was a great devotee of the Lord, so he went to see Krishna. And at this point, the baby inhaled. And Martin Deya Rishi was drawn into his body. So he entered within the body of the Lord and found himself within the universe, not in the state of devastation, but in the phase of creation in which everything was there uh, in a nice orderly fashion with the planets and so on and so forth. And then Krishna exhaled again and he came out of Krishna's body and once again he was in the ocean of devastation. So this is the uh, example. So the point here is that one cannot conceive of Krishna as being situated in three-dimensional space or four-dimensional for that matter because the kind of situation that we're describing here is impossible if you're within uh, say three-dimensional space if you have a form within three-dimensional space then what is within that form is definitely smaller than what is outside of it you can't say that what, out, what is outside also lies inside but in the case of Krishna, that is the fact. Uh, actually, uh, you can look at... Hmm. Let's see. Uh, right. He's sort of like an avaduta. Probably he self-realized that he's just not letting on. He doesn't want to have the association of, of those on a lower level of realization. <laughs> so, in any case, uh, the mathematicians have studied the idea of space quite extensively, trying to figure out what it is. And so they came up with the idea that the, the basic starting point for understanding what space is, is the idea of how things are connected together so that they're either next to each other or they're far apart. So they call this neighborhood relations. Uh, so if you take a bunch of points, let's imagine it has points, you can put them together with different neighborhood relations and get different kinds of space. For example, if you put them together in a, in a grid, horizontally, you can get two-dimensional space. So each point you can imagine is connected to four neighboring points and it goes out in a plane. Or you can imagine taking the same points and connecting them together in a three-dimensional grid. That is, each point is connected now to six neighboring points. And there are various other ways you can connect them. So the idea is that the way they're connected together determines the space. So what this verse in the Brahma Samhita is saying is that from Krishna's viewpoint, every point is connected to every other point. So everything becomes a perfect unit. So uh, now the dimensionality of space is a measure of how things are connected together. For example, in the case where one point is connected to four, you call it two-dimensional. Or when one point is connected to six, you call it three-dimensional. So you can go on up in that way. So, if every point is connected to every point, you could say it's infinite dimensional. So that's the kind of uh, space that's existing in the, uh, according to the Vedic literature. So then, why do we see three-dimensional space only? Well, if you have infinite dimensional space, if you place a limitation on certain entities within that space, then they can operate only within a limited number of dimensions. So the idea is that there are different limitations that can be imposed on the senses of the living entities. So according to the Vedic literature, the senses include senses of perception and senses that perform work. So with senses of perception, we become aware of things in other places. This also brings up the idea of 
neighborhood relations or how things connect together in space because our senses tell us what's happening next to us but they don't tell us so much about what's happening far away that's the nature of the senses so and also there are the senses that perform action such as the arms and legs and so on so with these senses you can go to a different place but you can only go to neighboring places at least immediately that is to get to a distant place you have to go through all the neighboring places that are in between so the senses are related to what space is you can say so different beings have senses with different capacities uh, Krishna has senses with unlimited capacity and so he can perceive every point in space simultaneously in fact it's not that these points are at a distance from him but he is at every point in space simultaneously so it says he's an undifferentiated entity there, he can't be divided up into parts because he's actually everywhere at once this is almost like the, the big bang idea that you start out with a point and everything expands from it but actually for Krishna everything is in a unit completely accessible all at once so this is essentially inconceivable from our standpoint but that's Krishna's situation so this means that Krishna is not situated in say a three-dimensional space uh, Maya bodies use this misconception to uh, advocate their impersonal conceptions for example when I was in Vrindavan once one Maya body there it seems there are an awful lot of Maya bodies there, everyone I met actually was one. Uh, this was at the time of the science conference we held in which various different uh, Indian scientists got up to speak and every single one without exception presented Mayavadi philosophy. So this person uh, said to me that uh, Krishna is not absolute. He is completely relative and his so-called form is full of duality there's nothing absolute about it and so he cannot be God so I'll prove it to you so here's a picture of Krishna all right here's Krishna's arm right well below his arm here's air empty space then you can go down to here and here's Krishna's leg and down here there's his foot and below that well here's more space or earth or whatever so uh, that's duality his body is made of different parts and there's, it's situated within space it's in one place not in another place it's here and not over there so it's relative so how can you say that's the absolute truth this was his argument so uh, this is based well let's say on either deliberate or inadvertent ignorance of everything that's stated in the Vedic literature because uh, it's actually a misconception to think that first of all you have three-dimensional space and then Krishna is a form within that space in a particular place so the actual situation is that space is manifested from Krishna and Krishna's space is as I was saying infinite dimensional and all of it is subsumed within Krishna's form all at once and for different living entities this infinite dimensional space is subdivided in different ways to the limitation of their senses so uh, for human beings like ourselves we're limited to a three-dimensional continuum so that's all we can see however the demigod according to Vedic literature are not so limited and you can see also this is true of the various great rishis and yogis and so on and you can see that they can appear and disappear at will so for, at least from our point of view they're appearing and disappearing and from their point of view they're traveling for example it's described that a yogi uh, Srila Prabhupada said actually this still happens a yogi in uh, Haridwar or somewhere like that could enter the Ganges River and emerge at Allahabad 
to participate in the uh, Kumbha Mela. Uh, so it's not exactly that he swims underwater holding his breath. Of course, they're very expert at holding their breath, but still that's not the method. Somehow he just enters there and emerges in the other location. So for him, the, the way things are connected together is different than uh, it is for us. Also, there's the Prapti city in which, for example, in the Nectar of Devotion, Srila Prabhupada makes the point that a yogi can reach out and touch the moon with his finger. So you might ask, well, how can that be? The moon is very far away. And by any standard, it's certainly far away. So how is it the yogi can just reach and touch it with his finger? Or a yogi can uh, reach out from here and pick some pomegranates in Afghanistan. That was one example. And they'll be here in his hand. So uh, this indicates for him things are connected differently. Because how does he reach all the way to Afghanistan? Uh, so the basic idea then is the demigods have a higher uh, degree of connectivity that they can operate in and then personalities such as Narada Muni uh, are even more powerful than the demigods in this regard uh, they can travel directly to Vaikuntha for example uh, for example I was just reading about how when Dhruva Maharaj was liberated, a Vaikuntha airplane came to pick him up, and this took him to Vaikuntha. So there's actually air transport, so to speak, between the earth and Vaikuntha. Uh, a flower airplane can come down, and you can get on board and go to Vaikuntha, if you have a spiritual body, that is. And Srila Prabhupada pointed out that unless you have a spiritual form, then it's simply not possible to do this. Even the great sages and demigods can't do it. They can't even think of how to do it. In fact, many of them don't even know that it's possible. So, uh, this was a, a basic point we wanted to make. So there's this illustration here uh, in this magazine you may have seen, which is to illustrate this idea of higher dimensional reality. Actually, the outlines in this figure here are what is known as a, uh, a tesseract. That's a uh, four-dimensional cube. Uh, you can actually make drawings of four-dimensional cubes. Uh, essentially, if you make a drawing of a three-dimensional cube, of course it's just two-dimensional anyway, uh, from each point, three lines will emanate. If you think of the drawing of a cube, well, in a drawing of a four-dimensional cube, from each line, you have to have four points. Four, from each point, you have to have four lines emanating. So that's what we have here. But we put here uh, New York City uh, on one face of this cube, and we put a sort of heavenly theme. Uh, perhaps, maybe it's in the heavenly planets or something, on the other face of the cube to indicate how within the same space you can have uh, different realms of existence. So, and of course, as I was saying, this is the, the Vedic conception, but the scientists themselves have played around with uh, similar ideas. So therefore, one shouldn't regard these ideas as being uh, completely impossible a priori. For example, I pointed out this idea that in quantum mechanics the universe is continually splitting into copies of itself and the copies no longer communicate with one another so according to this idea we're having a certain experience but this is only one universe there's another universe that's certain things that are within their grasp that they can try to take apart you could say that uh, these are the things that are nearby and of medium size, basically. But if things are very far away or very large, then there's no way you can take them apart. And if they're very small, it's also not possible to take them apart. So 
the scientists are actually limited to sort of a medium range. That's why Srila Prabhupada said that all their explanations uh, take place in the middle. They can't explain ultimate origins of things. To explain ultimate origins, you have to go down to the very small, unlimitedly small things, and also to the unlimitedly large things. And also, there's the time dimension. You have to be able to go back in time. So, uh, as a matter of fact, the scientists try to extend their uh, the penetration of their senses using various techniques and various kinds of instruments. So to see things that are very large, they use telescopes and then radio telescopes and so on. And to see the very small things, they use microscopes. And also these particle accelerators are intended to enable them to see very small things. That's what they're for. And to try to go backwards in time, they investigate the rocks in the, in the Earth and they try to use, uh, to interpret these as records of, of what went on in the past. And then they try to use dating methods to find out how long ago these things happened. So in this way, they try to gaze into the, the past. But these methods are imperfect, and they become more imperfect the further you try to extend your grasp. Um, so, indeed, there's a fundamental limitation to science. That's the basic argument we would like to make. It may be that things work very well when you're dealing with things that are immediately within your control. For example, take chemistry. Uh, in the laboratory, you can mix together different chemicals and heat them and do different things with them and see that certain reactions take place. And that's more or less within your grasp. You can manipulate these things. And you can say with fair assurance that we see that they, the chemicals tend to combine in such and such a way, and it happens every time we do it. Uh, but when it comes to discussing the ultimate origin of things, uh, one has to go to things that can't be manipulated. Now, so you can say, well, how could you understand God then in that case? Well, of course, the basic point of our philosophy is that you can't understand God by the power of your senses or the power of your mind. If you try to do it in that way, you'll never understand God. You'll simply remain on a mundane platform. But if you surrender to Krishna, then Krishna, by his mercy, can tell you about himself. That is, we don't have the power to go to God, using our own power, that is, <clears throat> But Krishna has the power to come to us if he wants. There's no limitation on what Krishna can do. So, if we please Krishna and he decides that he wants to reveal himself to us, then he can just come to where we are and present himself in a way that we can understand. Of course, that doesn't mean that we can ever understand Krishna in his fullness, because Krishna is unlimited and we're limited. So how can the unlimited present itself completely to the limited? In that case, the limited entity would have to also become unlimited. So we can never understand Krishna in totality. But nonetheless, we can understand Krishna to some extent. And Krishna, by his own power, can reveal himself to some extent to us. And so, of course, the basic principle in the Vedic literature is that if we surrender to Krishna, then uh, he'll be pleased with us and he will reveal himself. So the basic premise of bhakti yoga is that Krishna actually wants to uh, reveal himself to us. That's the natural state of affairs. And he will do it if only we're willing to cooperate with him. And cooperating with God means surrendering. Uh, for a very tiny entity, that's the only reasonable kind of cooperation you could have between a tiny entity and God. So, therefore, our proposal is that if there is Krishna, who is supreme, supremely powerful and all-knowing, and so on, then there's a possibility that one can understand ultimate reality by surrendering to Krishna and having Krishna reveal himself. Uh, this is an argument you can present to someone whose position is one of total skepticism, let's say. Let's say, uh, you know, he doesn't believe any of these things, he doesn't 
except Shastra or anything like that. But you can say that as a matter of, of logic, if there is a supreme being uh, who is endowed with all these powers and so on, then it's possible that you can understand that supreme being by surrendering to him, in which case he will re reveal himself. That's a logical possibility. And the only way to really know if that works, of course, is to try it. How else could you know? Uh, if you say, I won't try it, but prove to me that it's so, then what possible sort of proof could there be? Uh, but you can try it. So that's a logical possibility. On the other hand, if there is no supreme being who is in control of everything, and nothing exists but matter that extends onwards and onwards, out to some vast distance, uh, then how can we really hope to understand everything? The scientists can use their methods, but how can they ever be sure? Because, uh, after all, one important point is that uh, what science can do is limited to what one scientist can do in the following sense. The highest understanding attained by a scientist is always an individual understanding. You can't say there's a collective understanding of, of a thousand scientists. Each one has his individual understanding. And that is limited to what he can acquire in one short lifetime. Uh, so how much can you learn in one short lifetime? Let's say that for many millions of years scientists accumulated knowledge and it was all stored up in, uh, let's say, some highly advanced computer memory so that just by pushing buttons, you could read out any part of it as you desired. Well, still, you can only have access to a limited part of that knowledge, because you only have a limited time in which to study all that material. So still, uh, that means for one scientist, there's an absolute limit onto, uh, onto what he can know. Unless, of course, he proposes to make himself immortal, which, of course, they would like to do. But uh, we'll have to wait and see on that one. We'll see if anyone is remaining uh, youthful for the next 50 years and consider that maybe he has a chance for immortality. But, uh, of course, even that wouldn't prove anything. We could be youthful for the next 50 years and then get run over by a truck. So, so there's an absolute limit to what you can figure out using your mind and senses. So by that method you have no hope, let's face it. If you can prove anything scientifically, you can prove that you have no hope of really understanding everything scientifically. But if Krishna is really there, then you do have hope. So you can consider that. It's either nothing or maybe something. So why not consider the maybe something? What's the use of sticking stubbornly with nothing? Yeah? Oh. You argue that because on one hand, it's like we have to reinvent the wheel every time you start over. There is a cumulative body of knowledge that we simulate, it's like you can you know, say the word flat and the person is still talking to in general. So that you may not be able to understand everything that is, like you would think it's a scientific tendency to learn more and more about less and less. But there are certain premises or motor car or in the world that people accept that they accept atoms or they accept whatever. So one can say that this is the this is the scientist uh, this is the religious uh, problem of keeping the thing off of our head this now. We have made things. So it's like I thought we can still and describe them all business uh describe them like trying to fly. Yeah. And it's the funny thing in the world thing is that you think you put this amazing with Well, Fred, Fred Flintstone had pretty advanced technology. Look at all those trained dinosaurs that he had. There is a cumulative. You know, we 
we are able to see everything, but, but why should we say like we do nothing? You know, where there's no nothing. See how many drops of that is. You know, we add a little bit and gradually go life to the better. And, you know, we're pushing God, you know, we're pushing out the parameters and all this. Well, the point can be made that there's an amazing... It might not be that there is a cumulative progression of knowledge. Yeah, but how far can it accumulate? It's important to ask that. Uh, one has the idea, well, we can just go on to infinity. But how far can you accumulate it, this knowledge? For example, I can give uh, the following analogy. Suppose I say that I'm going to uh, jump over the moon, as one famous cow is said to have done. <laughs> well, I can practice to do it. I can engage in, in efforts to improve my ability. Now, the first day when I try, I may jump three feet in the air. And this isn't much. But by working at it, a few days later, I may be able to jump four feet in the air. And I can say, well, I've made progress. And then, looking at it still more, I can come to the point of jumping six feet in the air. So I can say, I've made more progress. And I don't know what the limits are, but uh, what's the high jump record, anyway? Anybody know? Tri Trivia fan? Well, that's long jumps. I think we want high jumps in this case. Yeah, but let let the uh, the metaphor be understood in terms of, of the actual meaning of it. The point is that you may endeavor in a certain way, but that doesn't mean you can go unlimitedly. And I was pointing out a certain obvious limit. You see, in the case of jumping to the moon, there's an obvious limit. You know, you can strengthen your legs to a certain point, but at a certain point, legs can't do anything more. Uh, I doubt you could, you're going to jump more than 10 feet in the air ever, for example. Uh, so, similarly, but you may say, well, with machines and so on, we can unlimitedly extend our ability. But as long as we remain human beings, we're limited by our mind and senses. So how much can you learn? You may say knowledge accumulates, but how much of it can you study? Now you may say, well, this isn't a practical problem. Actually, we haven't had any difficulty in extending our knowledge thus far. But that's not true. Actually, today, there's what is called the knowledge explosion, which bothers people quite a bit because nobody can study all the different things that other people are coming up with. So nobody really knows what science is doing today. That's the, the point that everyone is becoming narrowly specialized and learning more and more about less and less. It's not possible to learn all of the different things which people are studying. So one person can only have uh, a few little bits and pieces of knowledge. So, ah. Uh, no one has yet seen how to get around that limitation unless you can build yourself a more powerful mind. Um, of course, someone can say, well, yes, in the future we'll build ourselves more powerful minds. Uh, but uh, there's no real indication that you can do that. Anyway, if you build a more powerful mechanical mind, then that mind will inherit the future that you want. So, uh, which, of course, actually there's one newspaper uh, uh, reporter was interviewing a professor from MIT who was working on artificial intelligence. And he said, well, how can you... And the, artif the, the professor was saying that, well, soon we'll build computers that are a uh, hundred times more intelligent than a human being. And the future will lie with these computers. Uh, maybe they'll keep us as pets. And so the reporter was saying, well, what about your own children? I mean, how can you work on machines that will replace human beings? And the scientist very nobly said that, I feel myself obliged to aid, to aid the emergence of intelligence in the ever form of the peers. <laughs> so, um, but there is that limitation on, on what you can know. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, so 
Well, let's take the empirical method. Now, I gave an argument saying that, well, if there is God and all that, then you could hope to obtain knowledge by surrendering to God and so forth. That's also essentially the argument made by Pascal, Pascal's wages. But let's say you don't accept that. Um, all right. So let's use the empirical method. Uh, so in that case, let's investigate nature empirically. All right. Thus far, we've done things with gross matter and built various machines. So that's nice. Uh, but there are various frontiers of... Uh, hmm. But... Uh, so there are various uh, frontiers of, of research which uh, suggest uh, new ways of enlarging our empirical view of things. So, for example, there's the dimension of the mind. There are the various psychic phenomena and so forth. Uh, the whole subject is parapsychology. So that can be discussed. Now, later on, we have an article here on consciousness. And we mention a couple of these things. Uh, of course, one point about this magazine is that it's so brief that we hardly touch on, on these various points. But, uh, for example, there's evidence, empirical evidence for reincarnation. Uh, now, among hardline scientists, this is considered to be absolute rubbish. But all right, uh, there's evidence for it. So how can you say it's rubbish? You're not being a real empiricist if you say that. A real empiricist has to look at all the data. If it's data that's coming in, then you have to look at it. How can you say that you're an empiricist if you don't? Uh, if you don't look at the data that's coming in, whatever it may be, then you're just being dogmatic. Now, actually, it's a fact that people, as a rule, tend to be dogmatic. It's natural. Uh, in a way, it's not even harmful if you've got the right dogma. That's the advantage of having a civilization in which you really do have the absolute truth coming down. Because in a civilization like that, if people become dogmatic about this knowledge, then that's perfectly all right. Because they're becoming dogmatic about something that really is true anyway. Uh, actually, the tendency to be dogmatic is there due to the fact that it's so hard to figure everything out using your senses. So therefore, people have a natural tendency just to believe something regardless of what they see. So actually, the tendency of most human beings is that they believe a given thing. And if they see something that contradicts it, they think, there must be something wrong with what I'm seeing. Anyway, I don't believe it. And they go on believing what they believed before. Most people are like that most of the time. So that's known as being dogmatic. So the scientists also tend to be that way. Of course, they accuse the religionists of being dogmatic. And it's true that religions have come up with some interesting dogmas. Uh, it's been argued that the world was created in 4004 BC, and that if in a short life of maybe 70 years or so, uh, you don't surrender to Jesus, then you'll burn in hell for eternity. And, and other things which uh, have got certain drawbacks. And so therefore, dogmatic religion has acquired a very bad name. Other people have uh, acquired the idea that if somebody doesn't accept the dogmas of the current religion, then we should put him on something known as a raft in which we pull him up, stretch him out with ropes until all his joints burst open. Uh, 
And meanwhile, we should light a fire under his back and stick sharp spikes under his fingernails. <laughs> and then, finally, if he accepts our dogmas, then we should take him out and burn him at the stake. So these kinds of things gave uh, religion a bad name. And the scientists are carrying on the noble tradition of opposing religious dogma in order to save people from this kind of thing. Uh, so they will say dogma is very bad. But unfortunately, uh, like other people, scientists tend to be dogmatic. So the tendency is that they will accept a certain viewpoint. So the physicists, for example, uh, have a certain theoretical picture of what is possible in nature. And they view everything as made up of atoms, electromagnetic fields, subatomic particles, and various things like this. So if you tell them, well, here we have evidence that a person is remembering a previous existence, uh, they will say, well, as far as our picture of things is concerned, that's simply not possible. Physically, there's no way that could happen. So therefore, it doesn't happen. So therefore, if somebody reports this, there's a mistake somewhere. Maybe somebody's making up the story or something like that. But the fact is there is evidence like this. So you can delve into it and see what the evidence is. Now, naturally, if you do that, since you're using the empirical method, you're going to run into problems. But if you're going to use the empirical method, you have to expect that. It is imperfect. Uh, you can never really be sure. There are always other ways of looking at the evidence and so forth. But that's the way it works with science. So if you say we've made all this great progress using that imperfect method, then why not use it here? Uh, why say at this point, well, it's imperfect, therefore we won't accept the, the conclusion? Uh, because you were just arguing a few minutes ago that using these imperfect methods we've made such great progress, so why shouldn't we use these methods? So, using the same imperfect empirical methods, you can, for example, find that there's evidence for reincarnation. But if there's reincarnation, what does that mean? That means that some kind of organized entity with mental powers, with memory, with emotions, and so forth, uh, which is completely invisible, is leaving one body that dies and going somehow to another body which is being born, or maybe going into that body before it's born. Who knows exactly how it works? But somehow that has to be happening. And that's completely invisible. So that immediately means there's an invisible world. And it's inhabited with sentient beings. So immediately you accept one of the basic tenets of religion. Because all religions basically have said there's an invisible world. It's inhabited with beings who have different powers and so forth. So empiricism leads you to that conclusion. And then in this... Uh, magazine, we also indicated these out-of-body experiences. For example, here's a picture of uh, a fellow, a sort of ghost-like being, hovering over an operating table. So the point is that people with medical crises in which they go into a coma uh, have, in many cases, awakened from the coma and reported that during the time that they were supposedly uh, out of commission, physically, they were experiencing what was going on around them from a different perspective. For example, this shows a person who's had a heart attack being resuscitated by uh, the electroshock method in which they put two what they call paddles on the person's chest and put an electric shock to them. And this jolts the heart back into operation. So during that time, the heart is not beating, which means no blood is going to the brain. And if that happens, the person passes out almost immediately. You maybe know what happens sometimes if you get up very quickly and you feel a little faint. Uh, the explanation is, well, the, the blood circulation to the brain isn't working quite right. So just for a moment, if the blood circulation is cut off, you begin to feel pain. So if the heart completely stops, you black out completely. At least this is the understanding that the doctors have of what happens. Uh, and if it stops for more than a few minutes, then there's irreversible brain damage. 
So the idea is that this person's heart is stopped. His brain supposedly doesn't work according to medical science. This is empiricism, of course. You can say, well, maybe we don't understand things properly. But still, let's accept the progress that we've made in medicine. We are not against progress, right? So, accepting this progress, we accept this understanding. Well then, the person wakes up from the experience later on and says, well, doctor, while uh, uh, I was out, uh, I saw what you were doing because I was floating above the operating table in my uh, in a subtle form. And I heard everything you said. You said this and this, and you cracked a certain joke about my uh, protruding abdomen, which I definitely dislike very strongly. Uh, and furthermore, you did this, this, and this, and it turns out that it's right. So how did that happen? So there's empirical evidence uh, for the existence of the troubled body. So if a person is actually an empiricist, then he can consider these things. Now, of course, the road of empirical investigation is a very long road. Uh, you know, you can't just instantaneously come to final conclusions. But um, that's the way it is with empiricism. But you can consider this. And it can be argued that if you uh, consider empirical evidence, then the Vedic picture of things is not uh, perhaps so bad. That's a very long story, of course. So we better stop here. I'm going to